This is Terry Howell from the Talk Back Fans Podcast, and you're listening to the Barbecue Central Show with the incomparable host, Greg Rempe. Start the game! Let's go! We'll do it live. Do it live! I can, I'll write it and we'll do it live! So to get that perfect barbecue, you use wood. Are you sure it's safe? Whatever. We put the lighter fluid on, strike the match, and... Oh! Should we call the fire department? That might be a good idea. And welcome to the really big barbecue central show. This is the show that talks about all things important in the world of barbecue and grilling. The show originating from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame City, Bomb City, USA, Cleveland, Ohio, the barbecue capital and capital of the NFL shenanigans world, as it were, on the North Coast. I'm your program host, Greg Rempe. Happy to have you aboard here on your Tuesday evening's live fire fun and frivolity show. If you want to jump in on the show tonight, this evening, here's how you do that. You can get in touch with the show by sending an email to Greg at the BBQ Central Show.com. Follow us on all the social media channels at BBQ Central Show. And be sure to subscribe to the show podcast feed on your favorite podcast platform. Anything else you want to find out about the show can be found at the main website, the BBQ Central Show.com. And here's what's happening in case you can get the newsletter. It is a brand new month. We are now in August and joining me that very first Tuesday in the very first interview segment each and every month. We find the co-creator of How to Barbecue Right, the pitmaster of Killer Hogs competition team, Malcolm Reed, joining us for his monthly segment. Much has transpired in the last month since we had him on the last time. You would recall, and I'll bring this up at the lead here in just a few minutes, as we were transitioning out of our interview segment in July, I had a toss out question or a toss away question, throw out question, I think is what they call it. And I had asked Malcolm if he had ever used mayonnaise as a binder on, I said beef. I kept it very nonspecific. And as you follow me on social media, I got a good month or so out of mayo specifically on brisket, specifically with some guy named Dick Paste. Uh And the list goes on if you followed the show and followed social media. So what I thought was a, again, throwaway question right at the end just to ask something to take up a few minutes, spawned something that has gotten legs over the last month or so. Deuce Raymond has cooked a brisket with mayo. He's the one that really got the fire can going or the uh, the fire going, brought the gas can to the fire. And then somebody that will be joining us at the end of the show, Joe Martinez, longtime fan of the show and friend of show, also did a brisket with mayo as a binder. So this has really taken off. It might be a thing. We might be seeing mayo all over the place here over the next month or remainder of summer, as it were, and we'll see how that goes. But nonetheless, Malcolm Reed joining us 14 past the first hour. Then we will be joined by a first-time guest. If you like getting the heads up on all the breaking news in the live fire industry, especially in a business side, you should A, be subscribing to me on social media, and I'll tell you how to do that here in a second, but you should all be visiting this website, cookoutnews.com's founder, Wes Wright, will join us. For the very first time, and we'll talk to Wes about his background, how he got into the cookoutnews.com website, what he's writing about, and what you can expect as not only a visitor to his website, but I believe he has a newsletter that you can sign up for that he sends out semi-regularly. So just another avenue to get all the business that's happening and transacting here over the last eight months now. 
We're two days into eight months, believe it or not, and there's been a lot of business this year, as we know. That'll close the first hour, then we'll move to the second hour, and we will find friend of the show and former KCBS CEO Emily Detweiler joining us for the first time. Sands, anything smoked or live fire? That's the first time she'll be joining this show. Uh, When she was with Smithfield, she was instrumental in getting Smithfield to sponsor the show, which they still do to this day, thanks to Laura Paul and the gang out there. But she was the one that got that rocket ship off the ground and into outer space and then of course going away from smithfield as they were moving everybody out of that kansas city location over to the virginia location she didn't want to do that found a position at the kcbs the ceo took that ran it for about three years and just recently gave her resignation and is now out of all responsibility there so we'll get a little refresher on how that all came to be and then we'll talk about her time at KCBS as CEO, what she didn't realize was going to happen when she was in there, uh, some of her biggest accomplishments that she thinks. We'll also perhaps talk a little TV and some other things. And, of course, what she's going to be up to going forward these days. So Emily Detweiler at 14 past the second hour. And then, as I had mentioned a couple minutes ago, closing out the show, first-time guest of the show, but one of the longer-time listeners, the pitmaster of Smoke and Joe's Barbecue Pit, which is a budding YouTube channel, Joe Martinez. And we'll talk it top to bottom, side to side, belly to belly. Oh, my. Mayo-covered brisket as a binder and what it actually turns out product-wise. He shot a whole video. It's great. So go to subscribe to his channel if you don't already. And then you can watch the brisket mayo or the mayo brisket bind- mayo binder brisket video. Let's call it that. You can see from start to finish what he did. And, of course, as he should, he gave me full credit for coming up with this. Yes. Thank you, Joe. (laughs) Continuing to cause controversy wherever you go, and nobody appreciates that more than me. Malcolm Reed, Wes Wright, first hour. Emily Detweiler, Joe Martinez, second hour. Don't forget, you can follow me socially, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat, at BBQ Central Show. Live video feeds of this show can be found at Facebook and Twitch, slash BBQ Central Show, also over on YouTube, slash RD Rempe. And, of course, we have live audio on Clubhouse as well. So let's start here this evening because I love to do this. Uh This happened last Thursday, but it might as well have been last night because I'm still on fire about it. It's never happened to me before. And now it might be the question I lead with all guests for the duration of the evening, which is this. We went downtown last Thursday, went to Merwin's Wharf on the kind of central side of the flats, not east or west bank, central bank, middle bank. Had a a few drinks at the Merwin's Wharf where some of the daughters work and then moseyed up town to the Chocolate Bar. Chocolate Bar founded in Cleveland, but there's a few other fledgling locations across the region here. And it's, according to reviews, hit and miss. We've never had a bad outing at chocolate bar we've always had a great time they have an extensive martini list when i was drinking that paid particular fancy to me they have a great dessert menu Uh, the food has been definitely serviceable nothing you're writing home about nothing life-changing there's much better food restaurants in the rock and roll hall of fame city but this one is fine it's great it's right on the top side east 4th street which is the happening street on the east side of town and it's a really good jump off point or close down point, depending what you're up to. And this is what happened. My wife has a cousin. Her husband uh, were also up here for dinner. We made the reservations. We show up. There's hardly anybody in there. And my wife's cousin orders the filet mignon on the menu. It's $29 steak, so it's not high end. She orders it filleted and well done. Okay. Cast your dispersions as you may. Not something I would do. But she's paying for it. That's what she wants. We're at a restaurant. Fine. Well, the order is taken by the server, who was dynamite, by the way. Great suggestions. Navigated us through the menu. Made all great choices uh, for those of us that couldn't decide. And then came back a few minutes later and told our friend, Leah, I'm sorry, we can't cook the steak as you want it. The kitchen is refusing. And I said, okay, well, obviously I see what's going on here. Somebody's ordering a hammered steak. They don't want to get caught in the middle of something or 
have us complain at the end. I said, send over the chef or the manager. We'll talk about it. So somebody shows up, no chef's jacket, and says, yeah, we're not cooking the steak like that. I said, okay, well, I'm releasing anybody of responsibility. Just cook it. That's what she wants. No problem. Everybody's fine. He refuses again the second time and becomes a little surly about it. Says he's not comfortable about cooking a steak that way. He doesn't feel like he can send that out in good conscience. I said, relieve yourself of any issues that you might be having. Cook the steak like that because that's what you want. No, we have a sous vide process. That's going to hurt the whole deal. And I just don't feel comfortable serving a steak to you like that. And for the fourth time, he refused again. And then it became heated like an argument. And I said, look, we're the customer. There's plenty of choices here. She wants a hammered steak. Take the steak out of the sous vide, which you can do. Butterfly it and hammer that steak. In fact, the more hammered, the better, because that's what she wants. Is that something that we can agree on that you will do? Because we're ready to walk out. I was ready to walk after the first no. Luckily, he relented. Oh, by the way, she loved the hammered steak. But the fact that this guy is all up in my ass telling me that he's not going to cook a steak because he doesn't like the way we are ordering it. We're not guests of the chocolate bar. He's not paying for our dinner. He's not allowing us some type of promotion. None of that. He's just being a dick. House managers, don't refuse to cook stuff. Show your issue, voice your concern, and then say, hey, if that's the way you want it, fine. Don't be like this dick and refuse three times before I have to go get up in your business. It was very uncomfortable, but I will do that. And don't hide behind sous vide. Give me a break. That's lazy steak cooking. Hey, guess what? New sponsor announcement. That's right. John Furman with Bub and Mothers. What's the first thing you think of when you think of the state of Maine? I can tell you for me, it's definitely not great barbecue until Bub and Mothers came along. How a rub that is so flavorful and versatile come from a state known for lobster in winter. Bub and Mothers is a veteran-owned gourmet spice blend company that's only barbecue company using real Maine ingredients from real Maine companies. The rubs are 100% natural, lower in salt than just about anything else you're seeing available on the shelves today. While it's handcrafted and blended to be used on anything that used to have fur, fins, or feathers, fans of the rub are actually using them on everything from avocado toast to fried zucchini. There's even a restaurant using it to make rubs in, in their cocktails. You can see all the recipes at their website bubnmothers.com both flavors have won honors from the international flavor awards two years in a row rubs were used as guest judge gift on beat bobby flay and competition cook teams have gotten multiple calls using bub and mother's flavors both the down east dina dust and honey i'm sorry dust and the Heat and honey can be used interchangeably. Once you've tasted them, your imagination will come up with many ways to use them. You can smoke it, you can grill it, fry it. And in the dead of the main winter, you can even get a fantastic barbecue flavor from your oven or broiler with it. So take it from me and head over to Bub N Mothers and order the gourmet dry rub with main attitude. And know that a portion of every proceed is donated to the veterans charities please tell them the barbecue central show and greg sent you bub and mothers b-u-b the letter n mothers m-u-t-h-a-s we're back with malcolm reed right after this stick around we'll be right back Broadcasting live from the Barbecue Central Show studios in Cleveland, Ohio. You're listening to the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rempe. Welcome back. This portion of the show being brought to you by CookinPellets.com, your number one source for quality wood pellets. For all of your pellet-driven cookers, where do you go to find them? CookinPellets.com. You can buy them there. You can also peruse the other items that they have for sale. That's cookandpellets.com. CB and the gang out there at cookandpellets.com. We thank them for their continued support of the show. 
As I told you a handful of moments ago, it is the second day in October. That's a new month. It is a first Tuesday, and we are joined by YouTube sensation, barbecue championship pitmaster, and friend of this show, Malcolm Reed. Hey, Malcolm. What's happening, Greg? I am happy to have you on board here. I'm going to ask you two questions right off the bat. Did you know that they were making barbecue rubs in Maine? Uh, man, I did not. That's new to me. Are you excited? To, me, uh, making to, them, should I give you uh, a couple test bottles and see what Maine has to offer? Yeah, man, I'd, I'd love to try them. Yeah. Are there roughly 7 billion rubs stuff. now? There's got, it's got to be close. It's ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as a business guy, we're going to talk a little business here during the segment, but when you're looking at a market to attack, whatever industry, but we're obviously live fire here, at what point would you look, do a survey of what's existing and go, this might be a sector of the market that might be a little saturated. I would say seven, eight, nine years ago, we could start making that argument, but here in 2022, it almost seems like rubs are like cookbooks. You're not doing it to like make money, but it's out there to get a brand out. Maybe you can make a couple bucks, but when would you decide, maybe I want to leave this alone and focus maybe more in this niche of the industry? You know, I mean, that's hard to say. I guess it's up to each individual person. Where, you know, um, I think if you've got a brand, why not? You know, there's, I mean, especially if you're known for, you know, cooking, barbecue, whatever, making, you know, making rubs first. If that's, if that's your thing, go for it. Cause I mean, there's, I know it's a saturated market, but it seems like there's room for a lot of people in it because rubs are so, um, you know, local homegrown things. I mean, you get, when we go to a region of a country and there's someone, they've got their favorite rubs. I don't care what it is. I mean, of course there's some national brands that stand out that, you know, you see everywhere, but I don't care where you go. Somebody's got a recipe that they've had for years that they, you know, that, that's what makes barbecue great. Everybody thinks they can do it better than the next guy. So, you know, it's it's a competition thing and don't even realize it. Malcolm Reed joining us here on the show, how to BBQ his website. And of course you should be subscribing to him over on YouTube. If you aren't already second question that was impromptu. I just relayed a story on the way out of that opening segment where a guy who was passing himself off actually as the executive chef, but had no chef's jacket. You know, executive chefs love to wear the jacket that also says executive chef on it. He had nothing of the kind, but introduced himself as executive chef and then refused me three times after I said, Hey, I get it. Nobody gets it more than me. We're making fun of her. I would never order a steak like that, but this is what she wants. And three times he said, I don't feel comfortable letting a steak like that go out of my kitchen. Even after I said, I get it. I understand it. I feel it. However, we're the customer. And unless you don't have the steak, which you do because it was not told to us in advance of her ordering that you were out of the filet, if this is what she wants, give me what she wants. Have you ever run into that? Uh, you know, I've, I've never like had a chef argue with someone how to do it. Now, I may have had a t I've seen times where they'll recommend something else, different preparation maybe, but a lot of the restaurants that I've seen, they'll have a disclaimer right there on the menu that we're not responsible for a steak ordered well done. I know you've probably seen it, and that's fine. That's you know that's like their disclaimer. But this is America, man. If you want a well done steak, order a well done steak. I mean, if I was the waiter, I'd probably recommend chicken nuggets or somebody. Somebody says so they want it well done. But but you know, it, like I said, it's America, man. If you if you like it that charred up and overcooked and ruined a high dollar steak. Go for it. That's yeah, it was it was the first time I had run across that. I could the only place I could see it is if you go to a Morton's or some really high end independent steakhouse. But I would just assume that even if you go to a place like that, the person or the consumer that is a well done or as I call it the hammered steak eater probably weeds themselves out of that restaurant to begin with. They don't want to go in and drop sixty five or 75 or a hundred plus dollars on some kooky dry aged filet or 16 ounce filet. That's just never probably going to see well done. And it's really expensive and they just don't want to put themselves through that. Why do it there when you can go to Outback or Texas Roadhouse or Longhorn and get something for 25 or 30 bucks. Like we got here, at the chocolate bar, have them cut it open, 
have them hammer the shit out of it. And then you get it and you're out seventy, eighty dollars to the cheap. That's a, I mean, that's that's exactly the case to do that. I mean, I don't I don't think I've never seen it in a fancy steakhouse, I guess you'd call it like Morton's or something like that. I've never seen anybody order anything well done. But, you know, you go to Texas Roadhouse, you see it all the time. I mean, I I, I see people order and I've been with people that have done it before and that's that's how they like it, so I'm a big believer. Who am I to judge? Uh, yeah, exactly. And I'm a secret uh, conspiracy theorist on Outbacks and uh, Texas Roadhouse. You don't really go for the meat. You're going for that bread and that sweet butter. I think that's what everybody <laughs> really likes. That's what they're filling up on and then steaks like dessert or something like that. And the cheap margaritas. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Malcolm, that's in your it. latest podcast, you talked a bit about the boom and then bust of the barbecue and grilling industry. I'm going to have Wes Wright on in the next segment, who's actually a newer website covering the business of barbecue and grilling. But as somebody who is a retailer, you have, you know, Malcolm's barbecue shop there, you're moving products. How are you seeing it from that side of the business? Well, I mean, I, th I think it's just the way the economy is going now. I mean, things are tough. It's tough all over. So you're not seeing people, spend the money on the big ticket items. I mean, grill sales have slowed down, uh, you know, larger, larger stuff sold, uh, sold down, but the food, so food stuffs is still doing pretty well. I think people are spending their money on groceries. They're spending their money on gas and they're cooking at home. And so, you know, you're selling rubs, you're selling sauces, but when it comes down to, to selling all these higher end accessories or grills or anything like that, people are waiting on those, uh, seeing what the market's doing. I mean, with interest rates, what they are, I mean, there, you know, there, there was a time I remember just, it hasn't been long. You started seeing finance options for grills pop up on people's websites. And I mean, when, when we get into times like that, it seems like it's taking advantage of people. Yeah. It's giving somebody the opportunity to buy a high dollar item that, that they didn't have the cash for, but people just aren't spending their money like that. And so when these companies went public, uh, they it couldn't have been the worst time, you know, for, I guess, Weber, Traeger, there's a few others that went public. But, um, man, their, their stocks are taking a bad hit. And I, I think it's just because combination of COVID, war in Ukraine, I mean, supply chain logistics, and then, you know, interest rates. We've got, a, we've got times that we've never seen. So it's tough. But don't listen to me for finance advice. I'm a barbecue guy. <laughs> do, do you think also, aside from all of those factors that you had mentioned, that over the past two years, uh, people just won out and – kind of shot their wad on a number of cookers. Maybe it would have taken them five, six, seven years to accumulate, but over the last two years, they're trapped at home, so they just gobbled them all up in one go. I think so. I mean, you got to think you're buying an item that, sh that, that you hope to last you five to ten years when you, when you drop a grand on a grill. Um, another thing, we've got so many different manufacturers on the market now. It's kind of saturated like the rub market, you know, there used to be just a few players in it, but now you've got multiple manufacturers that are all making similar style or similar priced <laughs> products. And so it's, it's, it's gotta be tough on those guys. Do you think we're going to be in a position now as things are tightening up that some companies are going to be weeding themselves out, uh, whether they're doing it on purpose or not? I think we're already seeing it with layoffs and, uh, you know, Supply. I mean, when people when they don't have inventory to sell, I mean, there's no choice but to you know tighten up or close shop or whatever. You've got to you got to do the best to right the ship you can. And for larger companies, I guess that could be tough depending on their their market share. Share. You've been in this industry a long time. I didn't figure we were going to be talking about business this long, but <laughs> I mean, you've been in a, you've been in around a, a long time. You've seen business transacted in a number of different ways, and then you have these very weird standalone years that we had for COVID where everything was going nuts. If you were a barbecue restaurant, you might've suffered if you didn't pivot properly, but even a lot of those made it much better than any of the traditional restaurants did that had to close and figure out ways to now get to the curb or order through phones, what have you, forcing them to catch up to present day technology. But everybody else in the live fire industry was making hay like crazy. Doesn't it seem like, the highest level decision makers, especially in the bigger companies, would say, this this feels really good right now. I mean, we're really in it. We're really making a lot. Of, we're having record sales. By the way, none of this makes sense. We can't <laughs> forecast. We can't plan on this. We should be saving or maybe we should be trimming. 
uh, some profit margins here or there, just to be fair in the industry, because I have to believe, I'm just speculating, that this isn't something that we can bank on. We shouldn't be building huge factories or growing distributorships or just blindly trying to blow out as quickly as possible, thinking that this is going to be the new normal. My thought would be, let's be controlled. Let's ride the wave, but let's also realize that in year three or year four, this could really tick back, flatten out to what normal is, which was not a record-breaking year for a lot of manufacturers beforehand. Well, you know, I think that's what they probably should have done, or a lot of companies should, to take that conservative approach. But, I mean, we're just living in times where people want it right right now. So, they're you know, they're thinking the sky's the limit. If we're on this high, we're going to keep going. But there's got to be a place to where it stops. I mean, and we're, I think we've already seen where mm-hmm. the climb stopped. Now we're seeing the pullback. How far it's going to pull back, I don't know. I think I think the great thing we have going for us is that people love to cook at home. So, I mean, we, you know, you're still going to see people interested in barbecue. Um, I, you know, in the past few years, we've got more eyes. Barbecues became um, kind of its own phenom. It's its own, you know, major food group in the United States and in the world now. And I think, I think that's here to stay. People like it. You know, they like the idea of being able to cook this food for their friends, for their family. And that's kind of what it's at at its purest. But, um, you know, when you throw the business side of it, that's a whole nother animal. So let's look at one of the cookers that has really made a mark on the industry. I didn't really see it making this big of a mark, but due to price point, due to almost a a nostalgia of, I'm talking about the Blackstone flat tops, of course, you have a nostalgia of like a diner, a flat top look feel. You can do anything on it. You can technically cook any food that you want on a breakfast, lunch, dinner, everything in between. A lot of food at one time, depending on uh, what kind of a cooker you're getting. And now you see also a handful of different manufacturers getting in to the flat top arena. Blackstone is the leader in my mind, but Blue Rhino makes one. Next Grill makes one. Loco makes one. I think Traeger had filed patents for bringing some kind of flat top to the market, which they probably won't be talking about, but the patents have been filed. So this is obviously a newer sector to the whole live fire scene. Do you have a Blackstone and what's your thoughts on flat top cooking? I do. And, you know, I don't think they knew it was going to be as big a phenom as it has turned out to be. Um, there's, I love cooking on mine. I've, I don't have, well, the one thing about it, the price price on them is fantastic. I mean, you can get a four burner one. That's a pretty good size one. I think it's a 48 inch one. And you're only spending, you know, 300 bucks or something like that. They're not expensive. Um, and so it's it's a great way to cook a lot of food. I think you do get that nostalgia of it's like diner cooking, you know, the smash burgers, all the stuff you see at Waffle House, you know, all that, the, the hibachi. You can do all that at home. And people like it. They like, I mean, it's something that's different. I mean, there's been versions of a flat top around that people have been putting on grills for a long time. I mean, we've seen the cast iron versions. We've seen the metal inserts that go on grills. But there was nothing that was standalone and kind of a dedicated cult following of it that the Blackstones become. And that's what I think that's the first one people call. They don't call them flat tops. They call them Blackstones. Mm-hmm. And like, they, they, I mean, they hit a home run with that. It's like the Kleenex of the flat top yeah. cooker business at this point. How common is it where you are there in Hernando and the greater metropolitan Hernando area where we could walk through backyards? Maybe it's a little different because you're technically in the south here, but uh, interested anyway. If we walk through backyards, do we see a majority of homes that have some kind of charcoal cooker, some kind of gas grill, and now some type of flat top cooker? Will you see three or four cookers in the backyard, or is that more the exception than the rule? I think the the propane grill has kind of gone away, at least people in my circles. I'm sure, I mean, it's probably still the number one selling grill and they're higher end and people, you know, put them in these outdoor kitchens. But um, I don't, my friends aren't buying propane grills. They're getting a smoker. They're having a charcoal grill, whether it's a Weber or a PK or something of that version that's just a quick charcoal grill. And then they're getting a Blackstone or a flat top. Mm. Um, used to, you saw some fryers. There are some pizza ovens that are kind of, gaining some popularity but i mean a lot of that's just i mean pizza is kind of a niche thing so i don't know if they're going to stand the test of time but i think if i you know if i'm building an outdoor kitchen i'm going to have a smoker a grill and a flat top that's going to be my three that's going to get built in it and just because there's you can do anything you want with those 
Malcolm Reed joining us here on the show at the website howtobbqriot.com. And, of course, subscribe to him over on YouTube if you aren't already and catch his live fire videos when he puts them out. In one of the more recent TikTok videos, I think it was, that you made, maybe it was Instagram, you made a very summary cocktail called the <laughs> Pineapple Whip. So if you are amenable to That's giving it. us the recipe, just in case we're looking to knock a few back this coming weekend. Yeah, man, it's a delicious one too. It was my version of. I know you've probably seen the, the the pineapple whip at Disney World. It's kind of like the ice cream thing where it's got that creamy flavor to it, but it's got the pineapple. That was what I was going for in a cocktail. So I started with pine. You got to have pineapple juice, but the secret is the whipped vodka. And there's we have a brand um, in our liquor store it's called Pinnacle. I'm sure you probably have it in Cleveland. Yep. But there's other other versions of it, but it's a whipped cream flavored vodka. And you pair that with some Malibu coconut rum. So I, I, I usually do about two ounces each of those, and then about four ounces of pineapple juice and top it off with Sprite and make it in a 32-ounce cup. And it's a filled full of ice. And, man, it's a summertime treat. And it don't take but a couple of them with four ounces of booze in it. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, is this one of those things where by the third one, it's like uh, three pineapples on the floor kind of a thing? Yeah, that, that's it. You got to watch them, especially with the ladies, because they love them. Mm. Yeah, that does seem like a nice summery time drink. Uh, before I let you go tonight, Malcolm, and appreciate the time, I wanted to get an update from you on the continued effort on the Palmer Home fundraiser, where you're sitting at right now, and uh, what are the goals? How can we help out? Uh, well, I mean, I, I know you've heard us talk about it on here before, but the Palmer Home's a local um, organization here in Hernando that, that helps out with the uh, kids when they're, you know, misplaced from their home, whether it be family problems or whatever, they try to keep them in a good environment. And we try to raise money um, to help feed them for a year. And they have, they house eight kids to a family. And we took it upon ourselves to, to feed two of these families this year. I think we've raised, um, the last time I checked, I think it was over five or $6,000. And we got a pretty big goal we're shooting for. And we're going to keep doing it until September, but you can go to palmerhome.org and find out more information you can go to how to barbecue right slash palmer and you know it's on our website too and greg we appreciate you letting us get a shout out for that man you've been a big help last year i know your your listeners stepped up and you did a match and man we appreciate the efforts of just helping us do that because it is for a good cause yeah it's a cause i firmly believe in and the offer continues to go out and as we were kind of talking about this off air you were a little concerned with you know where you were sitting at now, but as we talked it out a little bit, you said, hey, with the award that you can get, top five donors uh, get to come down with a significant other, hang out with you for a day or so. It's going to be a big pig picking down uh, your place. So people might be sandbagging a little bit to see what amount might win <laughs> so then they can come big at the end. So we might have to wait a couple months to see that big bull rush of cash come in to push you over the edge. However, that being said... I will say this, first one of my listeners that uh, donates in and says, hey, you know, Barbecue Central Show, $1,000, um, a single donation, then I will certainly match that as we did last year. Uh, just make sure that you put it in your notes or comments or whatever so then uh, Malcolm or Rochelle can get back to me and said, okay, we got a Barbecue Central Show listener that has donated the 1000 and then I'll gladly match that, but... Uh, just something that we're happy to do and, and support you in this way. Anything else I can uh, let you talk about here, Malcolm, before I let you go tonight? No, man, I just need you to plan to come to that pig picking too. You know, you always got an open invite. So if yeah. you, you know, if you get, some, if you get somebody that steps up to the plate, you can bring them as your significant other if you want. Or Yeah. All right. That <laughs> might be we're, it. We're going to have a big time. All right. Sounds we're, good. We're going to have a good time, man. <laughs> uh, this is Malcolm Reed. You can find him at how to com or over on the YouTube channel. And you can find him right here the first Tuesday of every month. Malcolm, always appreciate the time. Hey, thanks, Greg. We'll see you next month, man. All right. There he is, Malcolm Reed, right there. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. So. The Barbecue Central Show. That was a error in fire right there. Sorry about that. If that could be it, right? Malcolm has turned me on to a great idea. If somebody jumps up with $1,000 and works that back to Rochelle or Malcolm uh, so then I can go ahead and match your $1,000 donation, uh, you can come as my significant other. I think you have to get your way there 
and then two location, but then they handle transportation and overnight accommodations, and then get you, uh, and then we would you know, get back to the airport. But uh, that could be a bit of a encouragement to you if you're so inclined, or if you want to do it together, let me know. Email me, and we'll work out the logistics on that as far as how our donations go in. Before we get to Wes Wright from cookoutnews.com, let me talk to you quickly about Green Mountain Grill, some of the best pellet cookers out there on the market today. A choice line to choose from, a prime line to choose from. Now, depending on what your level of A, budget is, and then B, what tech you want, and this could be limited coming up here shortly if there is a presidential review going on between Traeger and Green Mountain Grills, so we'll see how that shakes out. And then if Green Mountain Grills will still be in business, we don't know about that yet. There's things in the works. In any case, if you don't want the tech, if you don't need the internal meat probes, and you just want a nice, solid cooker, one that I've owned for years, you want the choice line. If you want something that has a little bit more of a robust build, if you want to have something with two internal meat probes and look in windows and Wi-Fi and then slash app enable ab- enable ability, that's not a word. If you want to have app enabled access so you can control that cooker right from the indoors and never go out, Prime Line, that's the one you want. What's significant about Green Mountain Grills? Only selling through dealers. So find a dealer near you, visit the dealer, get educated, and then you'll be able to pick the best one for you. Then take it home. You'll be educated. You'll be successful right out of the box. But before you leave, get a bunch of accessories. And don't leave out the pizza oven insert. You have to get that. Nothing better than the pizza oven insert when it comes to Green Mountain Grills. It could be an heirloom if things go the way of the dinosaur for GMG. But I love it. We use it all the time. So fun. Pizzas are done two, three minutes, depending on how you run the stone. And everybody gets to make their own. It's fun. Pizza night. Pizza night every night. That's what I say. GreenMountainGrills.com. That's GreenMountainGrills.com. And we'll be back with Wes Wright right after this. Stick around. We'll be right back. You're listening to the number one most downloaded barbecue and grilling podcast anywhere. The Barbecue Central Show. Stern, Jim Rome, Dan Patrick, and Greg Rampey. The Mountain Rushmore of talk show entertainment. Now, let's get back to the Barbecue Central Show. And we thank Malcolm Reed for joining us last segment. This portion being brought to you by Fireboard. Monitor up to six different temperatures simultaneously. Connect to Wi-Fi for cloud-based monitoring or connect via Bluetooth. If you have Alexa or the Google Assistant in your home, you're in luck. Fireboard fully integrated with both. Find out more by visiting fireboard.com or call 816-945-2232 to ask questions and then order yours immediately. My next guest tonight was put on my radar by my pal Scott Moody over at the Variable PR firm. He said, hey, have you ever read this website? It's full of barbecue and grilling news. He shot me the URL. I've been hooked ever since. There are reviews, there are reportings, there's breaking news. If you're like me, someone who loves the deets, then the Cookout News is the site for you. So let's go ahead and race to the hotline and welcome the creator of cookoutnews.com and first-timer to this show, Wes Wright, joining me. Hey, Wes. Hey, Greg. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you making time for me this evening. Before we get into Cookout News, the website, what we can expect to read as we visit there and i think a lot of us will become a regular destination across the internet nation for us let's get a bit of background on you before we talk about that uh, where are you at in the country what do you do professionally and then we can build from there sure yeah so i'm i'm up here in uh, metro detroit um my background is i worked as a mechanical engineer a long time ago switched over to finance and now i work in uh, mergers and acquisitions for a media company so are you dealing with the likes of uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce, media like this? <laughs> no, it's, it's business to business media. So like things like plastics, <laughs> so much, oh. much, much less entertaining. Ah, well, I mean, I don't know who doesn't love a good polypropaethylene or polypropastylene <laughs> or something like that. That's very intriguing, very exciting. So uh, do you have a, a long history in live fire? Is it something you grew up around? 
Yeah, well, I, you know, I grew up with the traditional Weber kettle, charcoal grill. You know, I grew up in the 80s, though, so I used it with heavy amounts of uh, starting fluid and things like that to, to get it going. Uh, but then uh, I, I graduated and got really into it uh, about three to four years ago. Um, I, I was living in Miami for a little while, then I moved to Atlanta, then I moved back here where I was in a house as opposed to an apartment. Um, and that's, you know, when I could actually have a grill again. So that's when I got back into it. Wes, as I do my background on you, I run across the press release that talks about the launch of the website May 5th of this year. How long had you thought about doing something like this and what finally made you pull the trigger? Yeah. So, um, my website launched March 1st. Uh, I, I'd thought about it for a while though. If you go back a year plus, uh, I played around a little bit with just making like, uh, cooking shorts on YouTube and things like that. Just, a another way to interact with my hobby, you know? Um, but you know, while I was doing it, I, I thought, you know, if, if you want to learn more about cooking, watch someone like Malcolm Reed or something like that, you know, I didn't feel quite authentic enough. So, um, I thought about it a little more, especially over Christmas this year. Um, and at, at my work, actually, uh, I was seeing a lot of industry publications on things like, like wheelchairs and like, you know, wheelchair industry news. Right. And I couldn't find any industry news on, uh, on outdoor cooking that was just purely dedicated to it. Uh, so I thought, oh, you know, well, maybe I should start something like that. So I, I spent a few months learning how to create a website and, and doing all that. And uh, yeah, Mar launched March 1st, so around there. What kind of traffic are you seeing? Um, it I've actually been pretty happy with it. You know, it, the first couple of months, you're just, you're writing and no one's looking at it at all. You know, you just want any, anyone to read it. Um, I'm at a, I think last month I had about uh, 15,000 hits, so you know, not bad for, you know, something started in March. Creatively, are you a writer by passion or something that you just like to do creatively? You'd mentioned that you've been a, an engineer um, a long time ago, but uh, so obviously you're a smart guy, but, um, you know, writing takes a little bit different side of the brain there. Is that something you just enjoy doing and like the outlet? Yeah. I, well, it's a good creative outlet. I, I didn't actually know if I would like it or not until I was doing it. And it, it's kind of a, you know, a nice uh, distraction or, or it's different from what I do for a living. So, you know, I, I find it fun to, to do and just kind of, you know, put my own spin on things like that. Is the goal in the end to make cookoutnews.com a full-time job or are you happy just watching it grow and you, you don't necessarily have a, a goal to transition into full-time? Yeah, I don't know if I'll ever achieve that, having a full-time. Kind of my goal right now, I'm just having fun with it. It's it's a good way to interact with my hobby. I have two little kids, so you know it, it, it takes a lot of time to barbecue and grill if I want to do it the way I want to do it. So it's a way I can interact with, with my hobby you know, just on <laughs> throughout the day and then when it gets cold too and I can't grill quite as much. Um, but you know, I, I really just want to have fun with it now, see where it goes. I, I wanted to make it too. So that way, you know, other enthusiasts had just new content that you could consume kind of year round. Uh, and a as a way to, you know, promote the industry, if you will, like it's, it's amazing to me how, how much the industry's transitioned towards tech, but yet there'll be a new grill release and it'll just show up on a website and you're like, Oh, okay. I guess they released a new grill. I had no idea, you know? So I think, I think it's, it's, it'd be good to just kind of help promote the industry a little bit and see where it goes. Are you looking to make any money at this or are you making any money at this right now? Uh, no, I'm losing money on it now. Oh, great. I, you know, just, just, Wonderful just business. Just expenses to get it going. <laughs> of course. Yeah. If I, if I could break even, that'd be nice, you know, but I'm not, I'm not really dying for it. Wes Wright joining us here on the new, uh, on the show. Cookoutnews.com is the website. If you haven't visited before, I think you'll get a kick out of it and really enjoy what he's doing. Uh, do you have a newsletter or something in addition, or should you just visit cookoutnews.com, you know, a handful of times a week just to stay up? Yeah, you can go to the website, obviously, and I have a newsletter that comes out um, Saturday mornings. Uh, I call it the Weekend Refuel, and you can subscribe to it on the website. So there's many different live fire sites out there, which 
cover the happenings of the industry to some degree. Derek Riches reports on it, does reviews, amazingribs.com. It's probably the biggest barbecue and grilling website, although Derek would probably argue with that, and there's been issues between those two uh, years ago. Nevertheless, Robert Moss is also a guy that uh, reports on the industry. He writes the Q sheet, and of course the guys over at the Smoke Sheet also report on the live fire industry in a variety of different ways. Where do you think you differ, and where do you think you guys are similar? Yeah, I think there's definitely an intersection when you get to grill reviews and, and releases to some regard. Um, where I differ is, uh, you know, I kind of my background in engineering and, and uh, mergers and acquisitions, a lot of my job is just researching companies. So I look through any public information that's out there. I, I go through filings with the SEC. I go through patents. I go through trademarks. I go through meeting minutes at, you know, some locale out out west where they want to build a pellet mill you know so i, I think that kind of information is is different and uh i i'm coming at from it from an angle of more like the tech and innovation side as opposed to necessarily the practical cooking where some of those guys have that covered where are you getting leads and scoops is it just from doing the research and going through trademark websites and, and patent websites or are uh like what are they called? Deep throats reaching out to you. That sounds weird <laughs> to say out loud. Uh, are they reaching out to you and saying, Hey, uh, you know, use me as a unnamed source, but so-and-so is going to be dropping this or we're filing that. Yeah. Right now it's purely just, just research. Um, and that's, that's got me pretty far. Uh, so far it's, you know, a lot of people don't even know what's out there. I, I, back in, I want to say April, I, uh, I report a story about, um, the good charcoal company was raising capital, right? I found that in SEC filing and I interviewed their CEO and he's like, where did you even hear about that? You know, he had no idea that that was public information. So a lot of that's out there. I, I haven't gotten to the the point where, you know, I'm getting any scoops for the most part. So, you know, hopefully that's, that's the next step. Once I get a little more traffic, it's a little more uh, popularized. You know, I'd love to get that point to that point or even, you know, working with brands. Do you have a recognition level in the industry at this point, would you say? And if so, like, what do you think it is? Oh, I, I don't think so. No. I, it's it's so new. I think, I think you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here, Greg. So <laughs> I think you're reading it and a couple other people. So let's talk about a few of the bigger stories that have been going on recently. And I'm not going to ignore the elephant in the room, which is the then boom and now bust of the barbecue and grilling sector. Not everyone is seeing the hits that Traeger, Weber, Pit Boss, Solo Brands have been seeing. What do you attribute their non-success recently to after they had two, three years of unrivaled success? Yeah, I think a lot of that is they, they um, and this was something actually I looked at on, on my website. I, I did an analysis of Google Trends. And they were at the highest level in history through the pandemic. No surprise, right? And you had it had stimulus checks where they were seeing literally on their POS systems right when they're handed out, they're getting grill sales. And I think the grill companies, for whatever reason, thought that would continue because you'd, you'd hear them on their analyst calls for earnings talk about how they think that's going to be sticky and, you know, and that's going to remain. And I, I don't know why you would think that. Uh, so I, I think I think that success is comparative. Um, when I did my analysis, I saw that we're back at the levels of 2019 and with maybe even a little incremental growth there. Mm -hmm. So it's normal. It's normal. It's just when you're comparing it to what they've been doing, and especially if you staffed up, staffed up to like have that continue indefinitely, you're going to run into some problems. Um, it's probably harder for companies like Weber and Traeger because they're public. So they have to answer to investors who, you know, every quarter want to see growth. Some of the more private ones, you know, they... I would hope they could ride it out a little more, but you know, time will tell there. I was talking with Malcolm Reed last segment and I was asking him, he's got a little, you know, rub and grill shop out there in Hernando, Mississippi. And, uh, you know, he noticed that grills had slowed, but there were a lot of the other consumables slash commodities that continued to run through the store at a pretty good rate. I had asked him if you're a, a top man or woman running one of these companies and you thought the best idea or the best bet to make over the last two years that we had never seen before was to bet long on this success and build extra facilities and all this other stuff. To me, that seemed like an incredibly poor thought, uh, terrible business 
uh, to do something like that. And in my instant chat, there were people saying, hey, I think what you're failing to recognize, Greg, is that the CEOs are not everyday grillers like you and I and, and are a little bit aloof. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think some more so than others, but you can you can hear it, you know, uh, I don't know if your listeners know this, but grill, if you're publicly traded, you have to go to and do investor presentations to drum interest for your brand. And you'll, you'll hear like Traeger gave an investor presentation last month and it, it was audio only um, over the internet, but they, uh, the CEO asked like, you know, who's ever grilled or no, is familiar with grilling or something like that. And it was, it was crickets. So their whole analyst community is people that don't even really know the product. And they ask questions about, you know, inventory, inventory levels or ROI or sell through or stuff like that. It's, it's not product oriented at all. So I, I think there's a lot of that going on. I had heard near the tail end of last year from some company owners that they were telling me inventory was building and retailers were not going to be in a position to take endless amounts of containers coming from overseas like they had been the previous two years. Did you hear any of the same? Yeah, I, I hadn't heard that. I knew they were staffing up or staffing. They were getting their inventory levels up because of what was going on with shipping. So that's how some people dealt with the whole, you know, shipping calamity that was earlier this year and, and the uh, end of last is they just were getting tons and tons of inventory. Um, I, I hadn't heard heard that though, no. I had Joe, John Morris, is that his name? Oh dear. I apologize. CEO of Solo Brands, uh, John Maris. There it is. John Maris. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So he was on uh, maybe a month, a uh, month and a half, two months ago, whatever it was. We were talking about the brand. And, uh, you know, he's another one that's suffering just like a lot of these other public companies that went off really big and have really ate shit all the way through uh, since they launched. Smokeless Fire Pits is the solo claim to fame or, or mostly smokeless. There was a fire pit from BioLite that was on your website that looked like you'd done a review on. Can you tell me a little bit about that and, and how it compares and contrasts to a solo? Yeah. So yeah, the ideal with a, a solo stove, you know, is they, is there's, there's a secondary burn on the top. They have air that gets preheated, um, that gets introduced to the fire and as well as, you know, quite a bit of oxygen through the holes uh, within the unit. And the idea is that here helps create, um, you know, a smokeless fire. Uh, the BioLite uh, Fire Pit Plus that they came out with um, is it's a product that's been around for a little while. But what they do differently is they actually have a, a battery pack on it that powers air jets. So there's three air jets, two um, at both sides of the top and one at the bottom. Um, and how smoke is produced for the most part is if it's an incomplete combustion. Mm -hmm. So any moisture that's within your fire and, you know, that's going to cause the combustion process to stop. So you're not going to just yield, um, you know, carbon dioxide. And I think H2O is, is the chemical compound. Um, so the, the idea here is it works with your phone where you can control the fan. You lay out your fire, it introduces oxygen through forced air and that, you know, creates a more, more perfect combustion process. Um, and so that, that's how it's different. It's, it's purely electric the way that they accomplish it. Um, I like the product too. Though it's it's a it's rectangular, which is nice because you know when you're chopping wood, it's it's a rectangle. So some of the solo, smaller solo stoves, you have to cut ends off or things like that if you want to add to your fire. This one you can just build it up as is, um, and you can even charge your phone off it because it's a battery pack. So it's it's great if you're out camping. Is it much like a solo in the beginning? So I always tell people, solo, it's exactly as it says it's going to operate, except in the beginning, you have to get that initial burn. There is initial smoke, but once everything gets up and running, then you have enough heat where you get that secondary combustion at the top on the solo stove, similar to the BioLite or different because it is forced air, so there's really no smoke from start to finish. Yeah, you have to get the fire going a little bit. And, you know, as I'm sure your listeners know, not all woods created equal. So you're looking for really dry wood. You know, I'll, when I was testing it out, I got some that claimed it was kiln dried, but it was too heavy to feel like kiln dried, if you ask me. 
Um, and you know, that, that gave some smoke. So you need the right wood supply to go with it to, to get that smokeless burn. Yeah. There is some introduction to, to get it going first, but then once, once it's going, you can keep it going pretty smokeless. What's the biggest story coming out this week you're working on? Um, well, let's see. There's, I saw a trademark today for, uh, Charbroil has two grills. I'm not quite sure what they're going to be, but, uh, they had a trademark uh, out for two different barbecue crew, uh, barbecue grill names. Um, and then, um, I've been looking around at pit boss a little bit just cause of, uh, some, you know, rumblings about their performance. Um, and I, I stumbled across some financials that they had out there when they bought the building that they're in Arizona. So I'll probably write an article on that as well. Well, we'll be keeping an eye out. You can find those writings over at cookoutnews.com. It's Wes Wright. Wes, really appreciate the time, the history on how you got going, and we look forward to your writings. Continued success. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks you got for having it. me. There he is, Wes Wright. Right there, cookoutnews.com. I think you'll really enjoy it. I love it. It's a great read. And then, as he said, sign up for that newsletter, and you get the refuel on the weekend, Saturday. So you can go back and catch up on what you might have missed. Austin Parsons weighing in in the instant chat. Love watching Greg trying to keep a straight face while scanning the chat and doing interviews at the same time. Hashtag fartless beans. That's right. (laughs) Actually, there was a bigger thing going on that nobody probably understood what happened there, but it was a whole thing that happened around me that we got through. You might have saw me laughing on that as well. Before we wrap the first hour, I will talk to you about Yoder Smokers, designing and building all their products right here in the United States and building pride through craftsmanship and world-class customer service. That's the backbone of how they've built the company. This product has a approach which translates into what can be a truly bespoke style product that elevates gatherings with friends and family, honored to have a trusted place in the backyards of America. From pellet grills to wood-fueled offset pits and charcoal grills, consistent blue ribbon flavor has become synonymous with the Yoder Smoker's name. Make no mistake, Yoder Smoker's flavor-driven design, unique to each style of pit, and their team has developed to have their cookers perform time and time again while it lasts in the competition for generations to come. It's this generational thought that's rooted in the handmade products and defines the integrity, the core values, American-made quality, and endless flavor, the benchmarks of Yoder Smokers. Go to yodersmokers.com or find a dealer near you, and if they have stock, buy it because they are quickly building a backlog. Buy it if you see it and you want it. Don't wait. You'll be sorry. We're back to wrap the first hour right after this. Stick around. Be right back. Continuing to produce incredibly mediocre content in an exceptionally professional way. You're listening and watching the Barbecue Central Show. Once again, here's your host, Greg Rampey. And this portion being brought to you by Pit Barrel Cooker, the most unbelievable outdoor cooking device on the planet. Currently available in three sizes with a host of accessories. Whether you're a it. Whether you're a beginner or a professional, definitely a cooker you want to add to the arsenal. Visit pitbarrelcooker.com and tell them the Barbecue Central Show sent you. And don't wait. There's a lot of great Pit Barrel videos that are crossing my Instagram and TikTok timelines right now. Not the least of which was what a Parmesan-crusted rack of lamb. Looks delicious. I don't know if we're getting to it. Tonight, Peterbilt Pimp by Day, Pellet Grill Pimp by Night, and hopefully, hopefully, Dan, somebody that's actually going to be interviewing a company called Pimp My Grill sooner than later. How about that? We're bringing it all full circle right there. You're talking about pimping Peterbilt. I'm talking about pimping Pellet Grills. And then there's a company that's Pimp My Grill for Pellet Grills. It's going to be great. We thank Wes Wright for joining us last segment. Again, his website, if you want to check it out and sign up for his subsequent newsletter that comes out once a week on Saturdays, cookoutnews.com. That's cookoutnews.com. And get updated on all the... Who would have thought we'd be in an environment now in 2022 where guys writing a blog 
or a website, a news website about more of the tech, the business, the mergers, and the acquisitions of the grilling industry. Uh Really? There's that many tech stories for grill companies that he can actually write about them and not just continually sputter out the same story over and over? Yes! That's where we are in the state of the live fire industry right now. It's a tech industry, by and large. We're pointing to the second hour. Stick around. We'll be right back.